you about foot problems and the aging. So let's give a warm welcome to Dr. LaFontaine. All right. Uh, good morning, and thanks for the Institute to have a uh, give me an opportunity to lecture today. Um, I'm originally from Puerto Rico, but I got in this Texas accent that is sometimes a little bit hard to, to follow. So if you have any questions, just raise your hand, and I'll repeat my last statement so you guys can uh, uh, understand what I'm saying. But basically today we'll talk a little bit about um, some of the foot problems that you may encounter in the aging people, but not exclusive for them. It can be very young people like you all today. So um, hopefully, some of you may have encountered some of this problem and kind of have some ideas to share with us. But we're going to try to discuss a little bit about uh, some of the epidemiology of some of the foot problems, the most common foot pathology that you're going to see in the elderly. Um, we are in San Antonio, and, and if you're planning to stick around, around Texas, you're going to see a lot of diabetic foot pathology as well. So we'll spend some time on that. And the last thing but not least, each of these pathology in have a treatment, and we'll try to, um, to involve those as we go with the lecture. Um, but we know that uh, our population is a, is a, you know, we're gonna be facing um, a high volume of elderly people by the year two, uh, 2030. Um, of this individual, one in three gonna develop diabetes. So diabetes gonna continue to increase, and therefore the foot complication secondary to diabetes will also increase. So we need to be aware of that. Um, there is going to be, we expect, an increased prevalence of lower extremity pathology. So not only for that reason, but for many others, we're going to need to increase the foot care, an appropriate uh, foot care for people. So that is important because uh, that affects uh, uh, mobility on patients. It will decrease health work hours. It will affect the activity of daily living. And some instances, we bring a depression to, to a lot of the elderly patients. So there's a lot of secondary problems that you can develop as long as um, um, with, with this problem in, in the foot pathology. But not only that, when you look at diabetes, the most common pathology I will see is going to be open wounds because of the neuropathy. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. And that will lead to amputation. So once you have an amputation, Amputated limb, then, then issue problem going to be very evident, very evident. And in along that cascade of problems, then we're going to be to be aware how to manage those. But basically, some of the basic problems that you're going to get in your foot when when you get older, the hour feet going to get wider and longer. So if you are size seven now. When you're 65, you're probably going to be seven and a half, or maybe eight and wider. So if you don't realize when you get older that that's going to happen to your foot, then you're going to continue to wear your tight shoes, and problems going to going to start coming up. Okay, so that's one of the biggest problems. Second, <coughs> the second problem is that you're going to see is that you're going to lose your nice fat pad you have on the bottom of your foot. Okay. Your heel is very padded now, and your ball of your foot also. But as you get older, you're going to lose that fat. That's what we call that, you know, atrophy fat pad. So you end up walking pretty much skin and bone. So that's going to lead to calluses, going to lead to ulcers, going to lead to bunion, to hammer toes, and all sorts of problems that you're going to see in the foot. And last but not least, your foot going to get stiffer. Because over time, you're gonna get also muscle atrophy. You're gonna say you're gonna get tendon atrophy. So your joint's gonna be limited as far as the joint motion comes up, and your foot's gonna be a lot stiffer. So if you don't have a lot of flexibility, your function as uh, your foot function as a shock absorber, you lose that. Okay, and that also will lead to the same problem we just mentioned. But who's at risk for these problems? Okay. We're gonna start pretty much from the toes all the way back to the foot, okay? So we're gonna start with the nails. Probably the most attractive part of my lecture. <laughs> but, uh, so I'll go briefly through that, okay? 
It's actually the most common foot problem in the elderly patient. The most commonly one is that I see, okay? Not exclusively for older people, but it's the most commonly one. And some of you that will encounter or are, has encountered some of the foot pathology in this nature, these are patients that actually can come in with your chief complaint for that reason, or actually it's an incidental finding. So they come in for heel pain, and they happen to have also an ingrown toe. That's kind of the two ways. But most of the time, the nails become thickened, discolored, incurvated, painful, um, anything you can imagine to describe it. The most common reason why you get a toenail like that is because you get a fungal infection or onychomycosis. Okay, that's what you get to see right there. Your nail become thickened, discolored. It actually, the fungus, the most common one, is right underneath the nail. Although we think it's to be fungal nail, the disease is not on the nail. It's actually on the nail bed, right underneath. So it'll affect the nail bed, and it'll change your nail plane because of that. Okay? Very difficult to treat orally, as you probably have seen the commercial of Lamisil, right with the, the little monster. Okay. All right. So that, that is, that's, that's probably one of the most effective treatment to do, oral, med oral medication. But it takes a long time to, it takes a long time to, to actually clear it up. So you really want to manage this patient, you want to take care of it, you need to start treatment, you know, if you want to have good toner by the summer, you're probably going to need to start in the winter, okay? Because the medicine is going to be working throughout the new nail plate. So it doesn't work very easy, you know, very fast. But in many instances, if your nails is deformed, you need to remove the nail plate permanently. Because the medicine clear up the fungus, but if you have a nail deformed, you know, it, that will not change. But interesting enough, the most, prob the most common problem that you're probably gonna see is gonna be neglect, okay? Patients that the relative will put them in a nursing home and nobody takes care of the time to take a look at it, to evaluate that. And you may see actually the patient walking around, limping around, you may see, you know, you may think it's a bunion. It may be something very simple as just neglection from, from the, the care of the, of, of whoever, of, of the caregiver. Okay? Now these are just some examples of the way that you can manage this toenail. Many years ago, we used to um, actually take out the tip of the toes, okay, and the patient would be nailed legs, basically. But when you have, when you take pain for just missing a toenail, a lot of people really go for that. I mean, they say, you know, this is being hairy, me, I have tried everything. I have to come here every three months, I get an infection, just take it off permanently, okay? The whole thing. The whole thing. So you can see how it's going to look if I take it off in the big toe. You know, that's how your nail look before actually removing it, and this is how it's after. So a lot of the elderly patients, you can perform this kind of procedure, but you need to assess their circulation to make sure that they will heal this procedure, because it's a somewhat invasive procedure. Um, this is actually another example of your fungal nail infection, right there and here. Okay, so there's different type of management and also the oral medication, topical medication can be also used for it. Okay, another pathology that you can see uh, on patients, uh, actually it is not, this type of pathology is not that common in the elderly patient, probably in our population, probably the most common one, is the actual, the ingrown toenail, the acute infected ingrown toenail. Most of the time, happens because we do bathroom surgery. You know, your toenails start kind of hairy and then you put it right on top of the toilet and start just going with the clipper, cutting, cutting, cutting. Then that will help you for a couple of weeks. But when you, when you cannot reach anymore where it's actually ingrown, then you need to come and see me because you can get in there, right? So, so this is how it's gonna look. This is a little bit different to the pathology I was showing you. This is not a fungal infection, this is just one corner that needs to be removed, okay? And this is what we call, I don't know if I have it here, uh, 
probably bathroom. No, I didn't have bathroom surgery there. But anyway, that's how we call it. It can happen also because somebody step on it, you wear a tight shoe for too long, uh, you bump the toe, you drop something. I mean, it can happen for any, any reason. You have a bunion. If you have a bunion pushing on the second toe, that will, the second toe will push on that corner and eventually get ingrown as well. So it can happen for many reasons. That is the most common reason why you see on the elderly. If you see it because they already have a bunion, which is pushing on the second toe. Okay, so there's different ways where you can treat it. You can actually just get a pillow, bite on it, and I cut on it. That's one way, divide them on the nail border. You can actually numb the toe, which is actually the most common way to do it. Okay, you numb the toe back here, make the whole toe numb, you put a, a tourniquet, and you do a matricectomy. You actually take out the toenail and put phenol, which is a cauterizing agent, and that will prevent from that corner to grow back. It will prevent from doing that. You have a nail plate growing, just that corner, it will not be growing anymore. And that's actually the best permanent re way to do it. In order to treat this, in order to treat this, you need to remove the ingrown border. You can give them antibiotics forever, but as long as you have the ingrown border, you're gonna do anything, okay? It's like a piece of glass. You step on a piece of glass, not until you take it out, you will not get relief. The same thing. You give antibiotics, you're gonna inc decrease the inflammation, patient is gonna, you know, gonna stop hurting, doesn't hurt anymore. As soon as you stop the antibiotic, you're gonna come back again, okay? So you need to take out the corner, okay? Now, sometimes we can get what we call a subungual hematoma. You can have a nice big jar, you know, of menudo and just drop it in there, <laughs> okay? Then, all right, a very heavy one. And you're gonna have bleeding underneath your toenail, okay? Now, if you get that, if you really, if you get it right on the spot, you're gonna have a larger hematoma than this, okay? The rule of thumb is that if you get a hematoma that involves more than the 50% of the nail, you need to remove the nail, okay? And some of you that may do some primary care work or may do some ER or maybe acute care clinic, you're gonna get to see this, okay? Some people, warm up a paper clip, and they do a little hole and drain the hematoma. I don't know, have you guys been exposed to that before? No? Yeah, they do a little hole of a needle and drain it. That is not a very good idea. It's gonna provide relief, because it's gonna decrease the pressure of the blood underneath the nail plate, but the, you, the problem is that you may be missing a fracture of the, an open fracture of the toe underneath. So you actually, you know, hit your toe and you break the nail bed, it's bone underneath. And if that's happened, then you have bone exposed and you're missing it just by doing a hole. So ideally, you wanna take out the nail plate and in inspect the nail bed. That may need to be repaired too. Put a couple of stitches to do that, okay? Now, if it's if it something like this big, then you don't really need to do anything. You just need to tell the patient, you know, you're gonna have a, um, you know, black spot there for the next six months until you get a new nail plate. Okay, and you're eventually gonna uh, leave. Yes, ma'am? How long does it take to grow? About nine to 10 months, depending on the age of the patient and the circulation rate. If I take your nail today, you'll be nail less for about eight to nine months. Okay? This is very common on elderly patients when they use a walker. They bump the toe with a walker. If they have it in the wheelchair, and you don't, you know, you don't, they don't have a shoe like many times happen. The toes are hanging from the wheelchair, and you know, you manipulate them, you, you hit the edges or something like that. Okay. Okay. Another, another um, common problem that we have is what we call hyperkeratosis or calluses, just a thickened, uh, weight-bearing surface of the foot. Um, many times those happen um, just because. Just what I told you earlier, you got a trophic fat pad. Now you're walking skin and bone, and your response to your skin is that it's gonna make more skin to protect itself. That's just a normal reaction. Well, it doesn't know how to stop, so that's why you get that thickened callus. So a callus is a 
is, is essentially a problem of pressure. So in order for you to get rid of a callus, you can pretty much walk it, not walk in your foot. That's really how you get rid of it. You can come and see me, you can, you know, the patient can go and, you know, do a pedicure, you can, the patient can do it themselves, they can shave it. As soon as you start walking again, it's going to come back. It's going to come back. The job is to try to get rid of how soon it comes back. You want to manage that. And the best way you do that is to really get in prescription insoles. Okay, you need to send them to a specialist of shoes, uh, and they will make an insole to decrease the pressures. Okay, and then obviously the insoles, the way, the way they work is like a pair of eyeglasses. Okay, as long as you have them on, you'll see, and you'll do fine. But as soon as you put them aside or throw it away with your old shoes, problem comes back. Okay, so that needs to be very important. So in many instances, uh, there are lesions just like this one right here. Right down there. Those are lesions right down here. <coughs> right there. Or that one right there that look like a toenail. That's not a toenail. That's a cat. Oh we call that a cutaneous horn. Those lesions, sometimes you can excise them and they will not come back, especially if they're not in a way burned surface, like the toe. You can, you can cut those. But essentially, you cannot just excise the callus because as you start walking again, get pressure on the same bone with poor atrophic fat, but it'll come back again. Okay? All right. Now, a lot of the problem that we've been talking about, like the callus and the ingrown toenail, that's usually what we call forefoot pain. The medical term for that is metatarsalgia. That's probably the second most common problem you're going to see in the elderly patient. Okay? In the elderly patient, that's the most, second most common. The nail was the first one we talked about, now this one. Because it's a, it's a pretty, pretty much the garbage term to any pain in the foot, in the forefoot part, you know, the forefoot. Anything in the toes, anything under the med head, that's what it is. And it can be lead to all the, some of the stuff that we have talked about, like calluses, for example. Uh, atrophic fat pad, we mentioned that. Um, inflammation of the joints, or the metatarsophalangeal joints, stress fracture, arthritis, okay? So it, it's pretty much it's a garbage term that, that you need to identify which problem actually leading to that. And we'll talk about those uh, briefly here. So coronal calluses, we talk about calluses, hyperkeratosis right on the bottom of the foot. You can also get them on the top of your toes Okay, like those right there. You can hammer toes deformity. You can, your shoe will put pressure on the toes. And again, the skin makes more skin and you get thicker. Okay, you can get also what we call the heloma mole, which is right in between the toes. Which is right between the toes. And that will happen if the, if the patient is wearing an inappropriate shoe, they're wearing too narrow of a shoe, it will push the two toes together and then it'll become pressure in between the toes and it'll get very thick and painful. Now when that happens, if you take a shower or the patient takes a shower and doesn't dry very well, it becomes macerated. And now you have all that hyperkeratosis, that callus, gets softened, okay? It gets very softened and it starts coming off and it may create fissures in your skin. And that's how it becomes very painful. So you really need to teach the, the patient to drive really well in between the toes. Sometimes you can get in what they call lamb's wool. You guys familiar with lamb's wool? Like it look like a angel hair. You can get them in Walgreens and Walmart and any medical supply, just kind of a hair that you can peel, just kind of put it in between your toes. Okay, and it'll keep it very dry. You can use a cotton, sometimes it's too bulky. A gauze may be too thin. So the angel hair, you know, the lamb's wool is actually pretty good to do that. So you can have them put them in there and keep it very dry. And that may help and keep the toes separated as well. Okay. All right. Any question with what we have talked so far? Nothing? Very simple? Okay. Um, another problem you can see is the plantar warts. <coughs> Um, this not is not very common in the elderly patient. Um, it's most commonly in kids, okay? 
But the thing is that it's usually most common in kids or the younger patient because it's usually it's a traumatic event. Somebody step on a thorn, on a rock, and you'll introduce a virus. Plantar where it's a virus of the skin. Okay? And once you do that, you'll start becoming very thick, look like a callus. But if you debris that callus tissue, you'll have pinpoint bleeding underneath. Okay? And that's kind of pathognomonic of a plantar wart. Okay? It's just uh, have pinpoint bleeding, and it's very painful when you squeeze the lesion. If you press, it doesn't hurt, but you squeeze it, the patient is just going to go off the table, and it's very tender to do that. So there's a lot of things over the counter you can use. They're not very effective in the foot because the plantar skin in the foot is very thick. So the medicine do not penetrate as good. But sometimes it's worth a try. If it's gonna work, it's gonna take at least three months to work. And the patient needs to apply it religiously. Okay, there's some stuff on the over the counter that uh, called Duofilm. Um, there are some Mediplast pads that you can like look like a band-aid, have the medicine impregnated and you put the pad and you change it every other day. Um, there are compound W, you know, all these have salicylic acid. That's basically what is the treatment agent for it. If you read the medical literature, you'll be surprised. People have taken um, high dosages of tagamet, like the uh, reflux medicine. Okay, it's supposed to work. Some people do psychotherapy on it, and they have worked some kids. I mean, it's just anything. Pretty much anything gonna work. Anything that's gonna create some type of inflammation there. Okay? I personally believe that if you the patient have a good blood flow, if you have a single lesion, it's better to take it out. Because it's very painful, you're working on it. So I usually excise it and take it out. I think it's the best way. The other thing you have to keep in mind is that if the patient have a history of warts any other part of the body, it can actually see in the foot. It's a virus. Okay? So as long as you have an active lesion, You'll, you have the chances of getting it any other part of your body. So that's why I try to be a little bit more aggressive and try to take it out. Okay? This is very common in the elderly patient, very commonly in um, especially elderly patients, especially females. Okay? And this is actually a callus aspect of your heel, right here, right there. And it can get bad enough where you can get actually fissures. The callus gets so thick and it can actually crack. And it goes very deep into your skin and it becomes very painful. One of the things that you need to keep in mind is that there are some dermatological diseases that are going to lead to this. Okay? Like psoriasis, lichen planus. They may have an increased keratosis in your heel. So if the patient you know has been treated for other systemic problems such as that, then the treatment of this is not just trimming the callus. You need to treat the primary problem. Sometimes you need to give cortisone cream, maybe a, a, a short dose of uh, uh, cortisone by mouth to decrease the inflammation process. But if that's not the case, which is the most uncommon one, this is usually due because we wear a lot of open heel shoes. Okay? So as you have a lot of pressure in your heel, you use open heel shoes, your shift, your fat pad shift too much. It does not very stable, and the skin is going to start be getting callous and thickened. Okay? A good treatment for this, even in, the, in any, any type of patient population, is that you have to use some kind of emollient. The most common one you can get uh, with prescription is called urea lotion, or the brand name is Carmel or Lachydrine. Um, you can put it there under occlusion. So what I usually tell the patient is, or the, the caregiver of the patient, I have them put that lotion on it. Uh, a good thing over the counter is called Aquaphor, okay, from Eucerin. You can use it, you can put it in there, and then I have them occluded with Saran Wrap, okay? I have put the lotion at night, put the Saran Wrap, put a pair of socks, and then that will keep it under occlusion and that what we're gonna do is really soften it. And then the next day, you know, the caregiver, or you can use the pumice stone, and it's just gonna go up. 
going to come up really easy. Okay? If you have a fissure in that area and it's very painful, then you can use silver nitrate. You guys familiar with silver nitrate? It's just like, you know, it's like a uh, cauterize the skin edges, and you can do that too. Okay? Another, qu another problem is acid food or tinea pedis. This is not your classic tinea pedis, okay? This is your end stage of tinea, if it's not get treated, okay? But tinea pedis or acid food is very common, especially in San Antonio. Very common on the elderly patient because it's, they have a very high chance of, get, of getting acid food. Uh, I'm sorry, they have very high chance of getting fungal nails or onychomycosis. So the same fungus that is on the toenail, it get on the skin, okay? So you can treat the athlete foot with a cream, but then a month later, it may come back again because they still have the fungal nail, it's gonna go back into the skin, okay? Is, is, if you get negligent to it, this can cause a lot of problems. It can actually get in between the toes, just like this one here, can create fissures and you can get an abscess. The patient needs to be admitted, needs surgery, and it's, it needs to be treated very, very aggressively. Basically, the biggest problem you're gonna have is that you're gonna recommend a cream, excuse me, patient gonna put it, gonna apply it, and in three days, they see no change, so they stop using it. So that's why most of the over-the-counter things don't work. So you need to tell the patient, you need to apply it religiously. I usually tell the patient, put the cream, and when your foot looks normal, apply it an extra week. Okay, so I make sure they apply it. And I tell them, be patient, because it will get better. Okay? The classic type of athlete foot that you will see, gonna see most likely to be two, two types. One's gonna be the vesicular one. It actually looks like very small pimples around your foot and it's gonna have a moccasin pattern. So it's gonna look almost like if you were, you know, your shoe is gonna look like an edge of dark, dry skin around the side of the foot and on the bottom. It's a moccasin type pattern, that's how we describe it, okay? The second one is the interdigital one. That one is, that one is very, it's probably the most common one in the elderly, in the elderly patient. If you get the one interdigitally in between the toes, um, you, you can't treat it with a cream, you need to treat it with a gel or with a solution. If you put the cream, it'll get worse. It's too moist. Okay? So if you, you, you give, you put a fungus in a moist environment, it's just gonna get worse. So you need to use a gel or a solution. Okay? And then you need to do and educate the patient. You need to tell them, you know, it's better to use 100% cotton salt especially white, not dark, okay? The fungus light, dark, moist, warm area, which is perfect for your foot, okay? So you need to recommend dry well between your toes, um, use, you know, white, 100% cotton socks, alternate shoes, okay? You can tell them, you know, so they can air dry out. If they have very, you know, they have a sweaty feet, that's good. You can put talc powder inside the shoes to keep them dry. So if they do that maintenance, that's what's really gonna prevent from coming back. Fungus is common. If you go to your toe in your house today and you do a culture, you grow, you grow tinea. You grow fungus, okay? The dermatophytes are the most common ones. So that's very important to, to keep in mind. Now, there's a lot other problems in the foot that it may look like acid foot. The most common one is called dehydrotic eczema, or, or pomphilix. That's the old term for it. Pomphilix is usually half an appearance. It itches a lot. Patients just find anything to scratch with it. It's very common in the summer. So I start seeing patients now with that type of problems. It usually appears to be kind of on the center of the foot, so it doesn't have that moccasin pattern I talked to you about usually has single deep-seated blisters with clear fluid. And something that is very key on these kind of patients is that they are a warrior. These are people that have it. They're very stressful. 
So I usually ha ask the patient, are you a warrior, you know, or do you have any issue that we need to talk about or somebody else need to talk about? Because usually you see them calm, they don't talk much, and you tell them, you know, are you being stressed, you know, the last couple of years, yeah, I lost my job. And there you go, you know, they come out with that. In the other hand, for this kind of problem, you treat this with cortisone cream. You, you put an antifungal on this, they're going to waste their money. It will not do anything. And the biggest problem is that most people do because it itches. And we think acid food itch, it, you know, you get an antifungal. And that's not the case. So cortisone topical steroid, you know, that's what really going to take care of it. And obviously, the management of the stress also. Also happen in the hands. Usually they have, they develop in between the fingers. Don't get the same problem. And you can get it together with acid foot too. So you may treat the fungus and they still coming back with blisters. Okay, so that's why a history of, you know, summer, uh, the patient is a warrior, you know, does it look like big blisters? Fun you know, acid foot doesn't have big blisters. They have vesicles. They're very small pinpoints. So those are some of the que you know some of the the problems that you may want to think about when you see this patient. You can do uh, you can do some study like KOH cultures. You know I don't do those. Those are a strictly a clinical diagnosis for me, and I just go ahead and do that basically. Okay, so um, I don't do the culturing unless unless I suspect something else that it doesn't fit any of those pictures that I may do that. A lot of, there are, for example, type of psoriasis that are palmoplantar psoriasis. You get it in your hands and your feet. You know that I may, it may think like to me like it's more like a psoriatic kind of problem Then I may do a culture just to rule out um, acid food or any other problem. But anyway, um, if, if you don't treat it properly, then you can get macerated interspace or maceration, which is this. It's actually, the wet space look white from the side of the toe all around. It look just strictly white. And that's usually just the patient not taking care of themselves or the, whatever they're staying, the assisted living area. They're not drying well their feet, okay? And that is easily treated. I mentioned to you lamps wool earlier, okay? That you can put in between the toes and that'll take care of the problem. Okay. Now, in the this is very common in the earlier <coughs> patients. We got venous ulcers. Um, I don't know if any of you manage wounds here or being exposed or like that niche, but it's very common. Um, about one million people in the uh, actually it's a little bit longer. About one million people in the United States that have venous, venous insufficiency will develop an ulcer, okay? So we're talking about a lot of people and it takes care of a lot of the healthcare cost. Each patient that has a venous ulcer per patient, per ulcer, the treatment take about $10,000 to get it healed up. And this is have a high recurrence chance. So if you don't manage the venous insufficiency part, you'll get another ulcer in the same spot. Basically, the lower extremity have a, a, a network of, of, nerve, of, of veins called the saphenous veins. You got the lesser and the large saphenous veins. Those veins usually will draw your blood from the foot to the, uh, to the, uh, to your heart. The, in order for that blood flow not to retrograde to your foot, you have valves in your veins. When those valves become deficient, you get a reflux of the blood to the foot, and then you get engorgement of, of, of veins. Those are your varicose veins. With that, you have the process of what we call hemosiderin. That will atrophy your skin, and eventually you're gonna get a lot of induration, and a little trauma to that induration, it'll promote an open wound, or, or a venous ulcer. The treatment for a venous ulcer is manage of, of edema. So you need to compress the lower extremity. There are different ways you can do that. The most common one is called the unabut. It's like a soft 
cast that you put from your toes to the leg. And that actually, you get rid of the edema. And that compression will allow the ulcer to heal. Most of these ulcers actually have a good arterial blood. Most of them, not all of them, but most of them do. So if you control the edema, the ulcer will eventually heal. The problem is recurrence. If you stop using the una boot and the foot get again swollen, all you need is a little trauma to get the wound again. So after the wounds heal, what you really need to get, you need to get some compression stockings, okay? And the best way to treat the compression stocking, especially on the elderly, are custom molded. You give them a prescription and you send them to a, spay that spe a place that specializes on getting those, those made. The reason is because if you get them off the shelf, sometimes they don't have strength in their hands to really be able to put them on. So you get them custom molded, they can make it with a zipper. Okay, so they only can put their toes and then they just zip it up if they can actually reach their leg. <coughs> for, the, for the caregiver, it's also easy. They don't have to struggle. They're getting the toes and stretching them and put them out. Okay? They can actually um, zip them up too. So I usually recommend to have that. And usually they, those places will measure the thickness, you know, the, the, yeah, the thickness of your calf and they kind of uh, make them really nicely for you. You need to do that. Okay? You also have um, very common on the, on the patient that are pet bound are the cubitus ulcer. You know, obviously I deal with foot, so for me the most common one are in the heel. But most commonly in the in the sacrum, in the back, this is just a strictly negligence. This is totally unacceptable in the medical <coughs> environment. I mean, this is something this these problems are due to us that we didn't educate, we're not doing the right thing. Patient doesn't have to do anything with this. This is treated very easily, keeping the pressure of the area. Obviously, if it's in the foot, there are problems like, uh, not problems, like um, devices like multipodus boot. It's a nice boot that will have a plastic bar on the back and it'll keep your heel off the ground. There are foam box also, spandex uh, foam box that they look like a, they look like Swiss cheese. They have holes, and then you can put the box and put the heel right on the hole, and it'll keep it off of you, okay? That is the management of that. The problem is in the elderly that if you get a decubital ulcer, and the patient have poor vascular, they have vascular disease, then you're dealing with a problem, because now you have a bed-bound patient with an open wound, no blood flow. I'll guarantee you they're gonna have a lower extremity bypass, or they're gonna have the below the knee amputation, one of them too. Okay, so, so this, is, this is about prevention. If you're managing a patient that you know is bed bound, you don't have to have an ulcer to put the boot or put the phone box. You put them before they get the ulcer. That's how you treat this, okay? So it's very important, uh, very important to offloading, to keep the weight off of it. That's how you accomplish prevention with this. Now, some of the biomechanical deformities that we deal with the patient are usually, you know, your hallux abductus valgus or your bunions, your hammer toes. Um, in the elderly patients, for the most part, these are usually severe problems. Usually they're severe problems. So when you get them like this, where your toe is overriding the big toe, right here, I mean, you can teach them how to tape it, you can, get some of the padding over the counter, try to decrease the pressure, try to get them a wider shoe, but you'll be lucky if they get relief with that because it's just too much deformity in the alley. So a lot of the time, these type of patients um, will need to get some kind of surgery to bring this toe down, okay, to get it straighter and, and, and do that. Um, this is the classic hammer toe, for example. You can see how the toe is sitting so I mean, there's no shoe you can get. There's no Nine West, no Nike. I'm not gonna do that. That toes need to come down, okay? I will need to do that. And this is usually due 
to a biomechanical fault. So basically, you know, there's no menudo can that's going to lead to this. <laughs> this is you've been walking on those shoes on, those, on your feet forever. Okay. Now again, you can advise them. You can get them a nice, you know, nice padding, Dr. Scholl's, whatever. You know, put the little hole right where the callus is, and that may take care of the problem. But at the same time, um, you need to do that today, forever, ever and ever. So a lot of the time, people don't don't want to do that. But it may work in occasions. You can have patients that they have a body. You can do the same body. You know, decrease the pressure. This is a diabetic patient I had. So I had actually have such a bad body that was rubbing with the shoe and he got an ulcer underneath the bunion. So I can get the ulcer healed, but if I leave the bunion behind, it will come back again if he goes back to the same shoe. Okay, so um, we, need, we need to address those uh, permanently. The key thing with the bunions is most people think that the bunion is a big, large bump of bone. It's not. It's a dislocation of a joint. So you need to realign the joint to make it properly function. So it's not like you go there and you shave that bump and the problem is done. It doesn't happen that way. It's a dislocation of the joint. This in here, this is a dislocated joint. This is a dislocate. This is part of the joint what you're seeing. That's not a bump of the bone. No, no that is that is a dislocation of the of, of of your of your joint because the way you've been walking for many years. Okay? Yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the old theory that how you get bunions. You know, I have a bunion, for example. I was telling one of the ladies earlier, and I don't get a fix, doesn't bother me, and I don't wear high heels, <laughs> right? You know, it's just my mechanics of the foot. I mean, I'm very flexible, flat-footed, and I just happen to develop a bunion over time. But yeah, if you, if for example, if for example, you have my same foot, and you were high heel, they might, at the same age, a bunion may be worse on you. Because the shoe aggravated, made it worse. You know, but I was predisposed since I born to get the bunion, regardless. Okay? Neuromas, that's a nerve entrapment. That's the most common problem you'll get if you if your ball of your foot or the patient's ball or the elderly patient have pain on the bottom of the foot. That's the most common reason why you get it. It's a nerve entrapment. It's called an aroma. We have nerves on the bottom of your foot, and since evolution took us to wear very fancy shoes, now those nerves are exposed to a lot of pressure. Okay? You get entrapment of the nerve, you're gonna get a sharp shooting pain, your patient's gonna tell you, you know, my toes cramp, or my toes goes numb, or I feel like I have a marble, I need to rub it. Okay? This is very common in any patient with foot problem on the ball of the foot, right on this area. It's called an aroma. Usually if you catch them early, you can treat them with injection, it'll go away. But if you procrastinate and you go with the pain with a year and a half, you need to take out the nerve. So nerve problems are really very difficult to treat conservatively. Okay? Injections of what, sir? Injections of what? Good question. Usually you do a little bit of uh, cortisone, and local anesthesia. Cortisone, if you inject cortisone, it kind of burns also. So you want to stay away from, uh, mix it. You can do some padding, you can do some insoles to try to relieve the pressure, but still, they may give you a little bit of a, of a problem. Okay, I pad them like that, take the pressure off a bit. This is a flat foot patient. Um, this is kind of, I just put this for the sake of completeness, because this kind of pathology is what's going to lead you to a lot of problems. Hamartos, bunions, tendonitis, um, heel valgus. You know, heel valgus is when your heel sits like that outside, it doesn't sit straight. So usually, he deal, you know, leads to a lot of the problems. That's why I just put that slide, just to remind me that that's the most common pathology that will lead you to problems. Okay? Some people have the opposite. A lot of people have high arches. Okay? And that will lead most commonly to calcium. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. If it's very severe, the shoe will not do anything. 
if it's not that bad, uh, this is what we call a moderate flat rate, you can get custom model insoles and it will help. But again, insoles are like I mentioned earlier, yeah, you need to wear them at all times. And then it will, that will help. Yes, ma'am. person with flat, or who has flat feet, is it better for them to wear a shoe with an arch? But and it usually hurts. I know because my fiance has fat feet, and he wears shoes with an arch, and inside of it, and it hurts him. Yeah, because what happens is when you make the sh when you get a shoe, the shoe have an arch integrated. Well, if you are very flat, like the picture I show you, you're trying to push your foot into a position that it doesn't need to go, so it's gonna hurt you. Now, is it good for them to wear the arch? Uh, shoe with an well, arch? usually that kind of patient needs to wear a custom molar arch, so you can make the arch support to the foot. Mm -hmm. Usually, the best way to manage those kind of shoes, those kind of feet, they're very flat. Is actually you need to wear a shoe with a rigid sole. Mm -hmm. Okay, not necessarily with the arch support, with a rigid sole. Doesn't let it. Don't let them use flexible uh, insoles. Ah, uh, shoes. You know, like Keds, the one that you bend on the center really easy. So you want to stay away from those. You can get other problems like arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis that will affect the foot. Don't forget about those. So you go, if you get a good history and the patient has rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, gout, those are primary problems. You may need to address those to be able to manage the foot problem. And last but not least, the heel pain. I think we all have a heel pain at some point here. Okay? That's what we call plantar fasciitis. It's usually a ligament that goes from your heel to your toes. And usually that ligament sprain. It'll sprain because you go barefooted too much, you started to go to the gym, all of a sudden you didn't stretch well, you just jump in the treadmill. And all of a sudden you start getting heel pain. So sudden changes in activities, changing jobs. You know, you, you have a set, you know, you were a computer technician, all of a sudden now you're a salesperson. Now you're in your feet that will lead you to get plantar fasciitis. People call it heel spur syndrome. That's a misnomer. There's nothing related to the, heel, the pain to the heel spur. I can take an extra of all you guys and half of you will have a heel spur. And maybe none of you will complain of heel pain. So the heel spur may not nicely come up on x-rays, but it doesn't need to deal anything with the pain. Okay? It's the ligament that's the problem. The treatment of that, you can do physical therapy, you can stretch them, all that works. Our support will work, but the bottom line is that you're gonna need to go back to a good shoe. If you don't do that, you don't go back to a good shoe, the pain at, go, at some point gonna recur. So stay away, you have your patient stay away from, uh, from, from barefooted, flip-flops, chanclas, all that stuff. Get rid of that, that's no good. Okay, again, you can do a nice injection of the same thing, cocktail, lidocaine and, or silocaine or whatever your choice is. I usually use dexamethasone, but you can use Canalog 10. Don't use high doses like Canalog 40 or Solumed or 120 or something like that. You can use that. No more than 20 milligrams into the heel. And the last, ulcerations on diabetic patients are due because of neuropathy, you got the callus, now you have a numb foot, you continue to work on the callus, doesn't perceive pain, so you don't seek for help, callus become an ulcer. That's very simple, okay? And those also will lead to, uh, if you have vascular disease, it will lead to gangrene. You can have an infective gangrene or wet gangrene or you can have a dry gangrene, okay? And uh, this actually, there's not much we can do. This bottom line needs to go to a vascular doctor, okay? Okay, this thing vibrated. That means I'm running over time, okay? So you need to, this patient needs to be referred to a vascular surgeon to assess their blood flow, okay? Shoes, you got those ugly shoes you can get patients on. I'll tell you, you got, feet, you got foot pain, and I get you a shoe that ugly and make you pain free, you wear them. Okay, I guarantee you that because painful feet is the worst. Yes, ma'am. What do you call it when your toenails turn dark and what do you do about it? I'm sorry? What do you call it when your toenails turn dark and what do you do about it? 
Yeah, usually most of the time is uh, onychomycosis, it's a different kind of fungus that will give you, usually it's called saprophytes, it's another type of fungus that you, you'll get, uh, you'll get, um, they'll get, give you a, bar, a dark appearance to the black nail. If it's not a hematoma, that's what it is. Okay. So the insoles, uh, I, I, I don't have any consulting fees for New Balance. I like New Balance. For example, they have different type of shoes. You can really find them to fit an appropriate shoe. They make shoes for you know, high arch, they make shoes for flat feet, they make sure, you know, they make diabetic shoes. New Balance makes them too. So they look just like that, but all white. So it's very amenable for patients. But you need to get, you know, San Antonio shoes are great. You need to get, you know, have a lot of room to put in. So, so that's a good, good way to do also, okay? What we can do, we can screen patients, we can educate, we can, we can not, we can neglect. Patient tell you this hurt, check it, make sure to educate, tell them what we have, the information we have shared today, tell them to share with them. Have them follow up with their physician, with their podiatrist, find them one if you can do that. Give that extra, extra effort to, to facilitate um, for the patient. Don't forget about prevention. That's it, thanks. Thank you for the opportunity. I hope it was good information. I think it was good enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were on the beat, so. Yeah. And they're important. They're important, yeah. That carries all of us. This is Stephanie. This is, she's our next speaker. This is Tom here. Nice to meet you.